Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my dissertation research, a lot with uh, spatial patterning. And then moving on into, I guess I'll start with the photogrammetry, but some projects that I'm working on now in my postdoctoral work. Um, sort of incorporating photogrammetric models uh, into uh, the 3D GIS and, and spatial patterning to understand a lot about site formation that's happening in a very complex site uh, like Dominici in Georgia. So Dominici is a lower Paleolithic site uh, dated from about 1.85 to 1.76 million years ago uh, at the promontory of Masavera, uh, promontory at the confluence of the Masavera and Pinozwari rivers in southern Georgia, uh, not too far from the Armenian border in the southern Caucasus. Um, so uh, Dominici is actually a, a lot of different excavation areas that are, are uh, in the middle of this medieval city. Uh, in that, the 1980s, some medieval archaeologists actually were uncovering these medieval storage pits and found rhino teeth, right? And of course, there are no rhinos in the medieval period in Georgia. Uh, they brought in paleontologists and eventually these excavations spread from there and have been ongoing for 30 years, right? So uh, going through a lot of data in a lot of different excavation areas. So we have very good uh, profiles throughout the promontory that are very, very different than what we actually have in block two and block one. Uh, today I'll be focusing on block two. We have uh, most of our taphonomic data uh, comes from this that we've collected uh, primarily Martha Tappan, uh, but over the last uh, uh, 15 years or so, block one has some of the same characteristics as far as the, the complex stratigraphy goes, um, but only about nine square meters were excavated uh, up until recently where they're actually expanding to connect these two. So we'll see what happens in the next few years. Um, but getting into the uh, assemblage, it's basically a, a very, uh, it's characterized by these very dense accumulations of bone and not just in a few different layers uh, and not completely localized into in different places. But we do have uh, a lot of jumbling of all sorts of different animals, carnivores, a lot of herbivores. Um, so prey species and predators, but also hominins, of course, within, within this context, uh, associated um, uh, skeletons uh, belonging to uh, Homo erectus, right? And here you can see uh, this picture of the, the complex uh, basalt, the underlying Masavera basalt, about 70 meters thick. This is what's underlying the um, actual excavation. So a lot of this seems to be dictating site formation to some degree, especially in this basalt depression here, which I'll point out a little bit uh, later on. Um, so here is our, our uh, block two data that we have for the 3D um, uh, spatial information. All of these uh, 3D coordinates, you know, originally done by uh, 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 just recording the data with uh, line levels and tape measures, uh, but now, of course, with the total station um, and incorporating these into everything else uh, with uh, bone stones and, and copper lights. All of these things, we have a little bit over 10,000 items. Um, in roughly 150 square meters, right? So uh, fairly dense and very interesting and different distributions of bone and stone when we're looking at um, it in profile, right? So we have the basalt here, how it dips down. We have another vertical uh, basalt wave I'll talk about, or a basalt slab I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but the bone and the stone have very different spatial organizations, right? So the, in the base of B2, this level here, uh, a lot of uh, what Reed Farian has, has understood as co uh, colluvial activity um, and some bioturbation leading for this uh, very thick lens of uh, stone material. And then most of the bone material is in these lower layers of B1Y and B1X, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so the profile here is showing sort of the complex uh, uh, stratigraphy that we have. Uh, the, uh, stratigraphy at M5, for instance, is, is very clean, uh, going from the B sediment, the A sediment at the base to the B sediment, the A sediment of normal polarity, the B sediment of reverse polarity. And uh, the A sediments were laid down as uh, horizontal ash layers, right? The B1 layer was then laid down also as a horizontal ash layer. Um, but after this happened, we have these pseudo-karstic uh, piping and gully, uh, pipe and gully phases that go through and are subterranean for the most part, at least in their pipe phases. Uh, they collapsed, they breached, um, and eventually we have gullies forming on top of that with B1Y either being uh, remnants of this initial pipe or this gully, feel in, uh, gully fill in general, uh, B1X and B1Z being uh, gullies, with B1 uh, proper being just a, a horizontal uh, ash layer. Um, Reed Farring in a forthcoming paper will explain this in much greater detail uh, as he's the geoarchaeologist, but uh, it's important to understand as we go through uh, the differences between um, the constraining efforts of, or the constraining factors of these different uh, stratigraphic layers. So 
To really understand some of these constraints a little bit better, we decided to uh, sort of incorporate some of these models of basalt, right? We took some uh, points to try to figure out if we could do it just by taking uh, total station points. That didn't work out so well, so we decided to move into something uh, more recognizable as a uh, photogrammetric. We know what everyone's been talking about at this conference, right? So here we have um, 904 photos I took, and I, I did a... Uh, Medium point cloud, I think it gave me about 60 million uh, points. And a fairly uh, good enough, I think, for what, for our purposes as far as understanding the uh, underlying basalt and the formation of all these different things. So here's a short video, hopefully it works. Um, and I'll point out some of these features. Oops. Come on. All right. Um, it worked earlier. So here we have this uh, slab of basalt that's sort of uh, sloping to the southeast into this depression. We have a, a basalt uh, a slab here that's vertical to some degree. I guess this video is not going to work, so we'll just go back to this one. Um, so a slab that, that's somewhat vertical and it's coming in and it seems to be breaking up some of the lower layers as far as their spatial distribution. We have another slab here and we actually have an overhang. Uh, due to safety reasons, a, a few meters were taken off of this overhang for, so people could actually uh, get underneath because the, the overhang itself goes back in a few meters here. So uh, to protect the excavators, of course, this is something that was removed. Um, but. So keep that in mind as we go through. So the analysis here, we're going to focus on the B1 strata for a few different reasons. So uh, the B1 stratum, of course, uh, this includes the B1 proper, the horizontal ash layer, but also these pipe and gully fill uh, phases of B1x, B1y, and B1z. And all of the hominid bones, of course, have been found in these layers uh, pretty much throughout uh, where they've been found at the site, especially in B1, or, I'm sorry, in block one, also in uh, M6. Um, and of course, uh, these are the, you know, the all-stars of, of Dumanisi. Um, these three all being found within the, the sediments that we're talking about here, B1X and B1Y. Uh, a few isolated specimens here in, in B1Z. Uh, but found in close spatial proximity to one another, these articulating elements. Um, and uh, articulating elements is something that we have a, a lot of at the site as well. Uh, we also have very few faunal remains, at least that are well preserved in, in the A sediments. Uh, they're very, uh, a lot of diagenesis or something going on there where they're not preserving this bone whatsoever, as opposed to this uh, B1 pipe and gully fill phase where we're getting amazing preservation of these things. And medieval storage pits are some things that are cutting into this uh, uh, layers of B1, uh, B2 through B4. And you can see here uh, the different ormos as they're called. Um, cutting into a lot of the distribution of these upper layers. So uh, B1 is the, the most interesting thing that we'll talk about, and most of our taphonomic uh, data comes from this anyways. Okay, so some of the aims of my research is to, to use uh, so GIS and photogrammetry as tools for understanding some of these previous hypotheses that I'm posited by uh, Martha Tapp and Reed Faring and the rest of the Dominici crew. Um, and basically, these hypotheses have uh, said that fossils uh, are very quickly uh, covered, uh, deposited relatively rapidly. The fossils uh, are largely autochthonous, not being uh, transferred in from anywhere, no fluvial deposition, uh, no colluvium, these sorts of things in these B1 layers. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is an important distinction because uh, apparently these things are 10 years old and, and still being ignored by uh, a lot of uh, different sources. So it's important to add another sort of line of evidence to understand and uh, try to look at some of these hypotheses from a different viewpoint. Um, so uh, some uh, preliminary analyses of other things I won't really talk about today. I'll just talk about some uh, new information that, that uh, I've, I've started working on. Um, but preliminary analyses of bone fragmentation distribution, bone transport potential, bone articulations, orientation, and dip, all of these have, have supported uh, these previous hypotheses, uh, part of my dissertation research. Uh, but we do have some expanded orientation data uh, available. So previously, uh, to answer this question, do uh, samples of elongated bone orientation reflect uh, preferred orientation in any direction? You know, a very good indicator, indicator of uh, maybe some sort of uh, hydraulic processes uh, organizing these bones in some way, looking for non-random uh, distribution of these bones. So initially, we have uh, total station data that, that, where they took two points right at the end of each bone. Um, and we could have three-dimensional orientation and dip data. But of course, uh, you can see here the sample is not so 
broad. So it, it was very biased towards certain areas. In B1X in particular, we had uh, statistically significant orientation as far as uh, being oriented in, in sort of a southeastern direction and dipping into the, the uh, basalt depression, which makes sense if we think of where this basalt slab is, is sort of directing itself into this lower layer. Um, the other ones, we didn't really have anything, but now we have an expanded sample due to uh, <laughs> a process that took a lot longer than I was expecting to digitize all of the uh, excavation maps. And you can see here we have a lot better idea of these different things. So in B1, um, you can see here in uh, sort of reddish color and green in B1Z, we have more dispersed distribution of these uh, bones and these layers. Uh, and B1X and B1Y are uh, almost exclusively contained within this basalt depression. Uh, B1X being uh, the gully fill and, and being above B1Y in certain areas. And B1Y largely is focused in the, the southwest part of um, this excavation area underneath this basalt overhang. Um, so just very preliminary data. I just ran this last week, so I haven't really been able to uh, wrap my head around it. But it seems that we don't have anything like we saw with the previous orientation data with this expanded sample. So. Um, I think I had, for the previous sample, uh, maybe 80 uh, for all of B1X, and here we have uh, very high sample sizes for each of these. Uh, and really interestingly, only one that, that shows any sort of uh, non-random uh, orientation based on these, these other tests that are looking for anything other than a, 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 a uniform distribution. Uh, the unimodal distribution does not seem to be something that, that makes sense, but I'm still trying to understand what, what this means as far as um, what it can tell us, but generally we don't see any of these uh, showing a preferred orientation overall, right? So uh, more uh, evidence, I suppose, that or lack of evidence that we do have some processes that are pushing bones in the same direction, or at least giving us a preferred orientation, such as uh, hydraulic processes, fluvial processes, these things washing through gullies at high speeds or long distance transport. Uh, none of these are supported by, by any of these data, uh, even though we have just, you know, maybe one square in each of these that shows some sort of preferred orientation. Um, though which direction, it's, it's very hard to say from these rose diagrams. Um, so with that in mind, if we're, we're ruling out these abiotic processes, of course, there's a lot more to it than just orientation, but uh, due to time constraints, of course, I, I, I won't really talk about that as much. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, later on if anyone has them. But, if we are looking at something where abiotic processes are not part of the site formation, or at least not a major part, and biotic site formation processes are something that are contributing more to this, how can we discern if they are, uh, if we can actually look at agent-specific parts of this, or agent-specific contributions to this bone accumulation? So do the distribution, and we can do this by looking at not necessarily just finding clusters, right, but look within this large cluster of bones, can we actually discern different parts of the assemblage from one another? And we can do that uh, looking at the distribution of each of these things and sub-assemblages based on the taphonomy, based on the, uh, the uh, zooarchaeology, these other things. And we can understand if we do have actually agent-specific uh, contributions in certain areas of the site. We can look at rodents, of course. Rodents are our classic bone collectors, right? Especially hystrix, like what we have at our site, the porcupine. Um, and we can also look at the distribution of, of uh, hom uh, hominin-modified bones versus carnivore-modified bones. And this can give us a good idea of what's happening in these areas, too. Um, so looking first at the rodent-modified uh, bone, about 25% of them actually actually are uh, are large enough to be from hystrix. The rest of them are, are fairly small, or at least have not been identified to any degree. Um, so not much is going on. They're fairly dispersed throughout this entire layer, and we don't really have any dense distributions of uh, rodent knot bones. So this can be pretty much be ruled out for not being a major contributor to site formation in, in, in this aspect. Uh, carnivore modified bone, you can see it, it mimics much of the, the B1Y, the B1Z distribution already. If we look at uh, uh, Modifications that are from uh, bone breakage, nine on the bones, of course, breaking the bones, but also digested bones. And if we look at the coprolite distribution, a very stark difference between the coprolite distribution and the uh, rest of the hominid mo or the, the uh, carnivore modifications, right? So very interesting, not only in plan, but also in profile, where we have um, most of these right here are actually south of this vertical basalt uh, slab that we talked about earlier. And 
uh, most of these are actually north of that basalt slab. Okay, so we have some sort of different distribution between the coprolites and um, other modified bones by carnivores and, uh, or I guess by carnivores and digested by carnivores. So uh, if we look at it, also looking at the kernel densities, of course, uh, we see a very similar thing. It, it highlights this a little bit more. And also if we run a, a chi-squared test uh, of this distribution, uh, between this distribution and the distribution of the overall bones within this layer, we see significant, uh, at the subsquare level, significant differences in the uh, counts of different things of coprolites in these areas. So higher than expected densities, right? So this is just basically a, a standard residual map for each subsquare where you're comparing subsquares to subsquares uh, using this uh, standard residual uh, equation here. Uh, giving us basically uh, how many standard deviations you are from uh, the mean, right? So greater than two, of course, is going to be significant. And you can see that the red and the orange here are, in fact, uh, clustered in this about three square meter area. So the implications for this are very interesting, right? Because uh, hyenas, of course, uh, do have some sort of uh, space use, right? They, they use latrines uh, inside their dens, outside their dens. This could be some very interesting uh, perhaps discrete behavior by carnivores in this area. And of course, if we pair it with the taphonomy, uh, I think the latest count, uh, Martha Taffin will have a forthcoming paper um, on the taphonomy, but I think most recently about 18% of the bones in these layers are, are, are modified by carnivores, right? We also have juvenile carnivores. We have a lot of uh, uh, interspecific carnivore competition in these areas. So it seems that the carnivore imprint and carnivore contribution to this assemblage is, is a little bit higher than what we expect, um, or I, I get uh, higher than uh, the hominin contribution, right? Um, so if we look at the evidence of hominin activity in this area, we look at lithic artifacts, which includes flakes, stone tools, uh, debitage. Uh, we look at cores, too, to, to sort of compare the distribution of these two. And then uh, co uh, high confidence hominin modification, so cut marks, um, uh, bone breakage, these sorts of things. And we see it relatively dispersed, right? It, it's not any different than the rest of the, the assemblage and the way that it's dispersed. Um, the only significant difference we actually had between all the different sub-assemblages that I divided into, into was coprolites. Um, so that's really the, the main reason why I talked about that. Um, but interestingly, it, the hominin modified uh, bones and cores are in higher densities in these lower layers, B1Y and B1Z, as opposed to the upper layers where we have more flakes, uh, more stone tools uh, than anything else. And some of the implications could be simply that uh, there is, of course, more carnivore activity in these lower layers, in these pipes, these gullies. Um, and perhaps hominins are just drawn to this, right? Coming in, uh, doing you know maybe some power scavenging, something like that. But clearly we have uh, carnivores and hominins interacting somehow because we do have evidence of cut marks and tooth marks on the same bone, right? So we have some sort of interaction between these and the taphonomy has shown, uh, Martha Tappan in some of her previous work, has shown that we actually do have evidence of early access to some of these carcasses by uh, humans, of course, and uh, some evidence of late access as well, okay? So uh, maybe not hunting yet, but definitely getting some early access to these things, but not at a very high degree. Still less than 1% of the assemblage seems to be uh, driven by hominid uh, accumulation. Um, so some of these preliminary conclusions, uh, this expanded orientation data, uh, we can, we can uh, include this a little bit more, uh, expand it a little bit more. Uh, uh, of course, there's a lot more work to do understanding it, um, but it supports a random distribution, right? It's expected if we have random accumulation agents like uh, hyenas, uh, hominins, these sorts of things are random accumulation agents. Uh, Faunal material in high densities in B1X and B1Y, um, whereas lithic material is more dispersed higher up, and uh, faunal material is dispersed lower at lower elevations. And the sub-assemblages sub are very interesting. Uh, generally, all of them are following the distribution of the faunal assemblage in general. The only deviation from that is uh, uh, the coprolite assemblage, concentrated in areas where surface modifications and uh, digested bone uh, or carnivore broken bones are not present. So very interesting there, maybe some interesting implications about uh, carnivore space use or carnivore uh, sort of spatial activity. Hominin uh, activity areas are, are not quite uh, uh, apparent in this assemblage and, and for good reason, right? The, the hominins here seems to be, seem to be a little more ephemeral in pretty much everything they're doing. And of course, some of the hominins here are uh, they, their bones show evidence of uh, carnivore damage on, on them themselves, right? So uh, maybe not uh, living in the area, but certainly dying in the area.
right? So uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. Thanks.